Yeah. All right. Um, hey, Sarah. Hey. Good. I am going to call the Moab City Council meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. on June 13th, 2023. And we'll start with the pledge. And I'm going to ask Kathy Holyoke to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, we next have our citizens to be heard. We also have a public hearing this evening. So if you want to speak to the public hearing, you're welcome to do that now. Our preference would be that you'd wait for the public hearing because then we may or may not take action afterwards. So it's good to hear your thoughts at that time. So we'll start with citizens to be heard. And we have Sarah. And if you could complete one of those four. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to surprise you tonight and talk about recycling. But... <laughs> Before I start, I just wanted to say, I don't know if you were all remember that email chain about the trash down at Lions Park and all that. Um, I know a, a elected official said at a meeting that that's not something you guys should be involved with, but I feel like it was vitally important. It is vitally important that the boardroom meets the street sometimes because there's a huge gap and understanding and working together works better when both areas are understood. And that usually results in beneficial action. So I do think if anyone ever wants to come with me to Lions Park while I do my eight bins, I'm happy to take you, you know. Anyway, I just wanted to talk a little about recycling. So I'm going to be 69 in a couple months. I'm not a spring chicken. I'm about to fall asleep right now. <laughs> but this is where I have bins. Dave's Corner Market, Rotary, Post Office, Sheriff's Office, the Parkway by the Gonzo, the bike jumps from across from the hospital, Science Bank, Paper Only, Beauty Terrace, the Moab Art Center. I have nine small bins that I process um, several, several times a week. Movie production office called me. I gave them 14 bins and put an outdoor recycle station that they use. Lions Park, eight bins. Many of these I have to process every day. So I'm saying if I can do it and I'm 69 and we're not focusing on the right things about recycling, if we understood it better, we would. And it would be many places where I do it, like the, the Mark and other places. <clears throat> Everyone gets in line and, and starts helping with it. So. Anyway, um, I also pull recycling from the trash at the ballpark and put it in the single stream bins. I just did that today with a, a young woman who's in family drug court. She's been doing that with me, except the glass, which I take home because it's landfilled over half the time. It's sent to a mark that doesn't take glass. So just to make you wonder, why do I do this stupid, it's like a drop in a bucket of recycling that I'm getting, even though it's thousands of containers a month. Um, each transfer trailer of trash that goes to the Klondike landfill, sometimes four a day, holds 20 tons of garbage. About 45 to 50% of that could have been recycled. So why does that matter? Because 11.6 million tons of greenhouse gas is produced to replace wasted recycling. An annual production of 14 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent due to wasting. I am a human MRF, a materials recovery facility. I'm a human mobile MRF, and I go around doing that. The items I pick up go to the CRC. Clean materials there are sold to eager local markets. By local, I mean domestic. And there's lots of capacity there for increased volumes that would increase revenue. Recycling lowers air and water pollution, creates many more jobs than landfilling, preserves rapidly disappearing wilderness, Half of all seabirds have disappeared from the planet since 1980. We are living on a dying planet and we are the ones killing it and we can stop that. Um, and lastly, recycling shows respect for the earth, which just happens to provide us with every single thing we need to exist. So, and I really appreciated your comments about the recycle things down there. That's why it's helpful for people to, to discuss these things. That's it. That's my light-hearted commentary. <laughs> See you later. 
Thanks, Sarah. We really do appreciate everything that you do. Anybody else, citizens to be heard? All right, we'll move on to uh, our first presentation and our only presentation, which, which is the fraud risk assessment. And Ben will be making that presentation. This is something that we do, I believe, every year. That is correct. And any of you on, most of you are on other boards. Um, any government ent entity in the state of Utah is required to complete a fraud risk assessment annually, and it's then to be presented to the governing board of that body. So if this is that presentation. I'll just get it pulled up here. And shared. Um, I wanted to talk briefly, kind of actually taking a step back and talking about fraud generally. So fraud is essentially the criminal deception for personal or financial gain. That is what fraud is. Um, I, I think the the simplest way to think about it is essentially, you know, how are we ensuring that our resources, the city's resources are secured? Um, and it's important to take a step back and, and think about fraud generally. And uh, I wanted, I put up the fraud triangle here just because it's important to consider as we look at the fraud risk assessment. So the risk or exposure for fraud increases significantly as each of these three components of fraud increase. So the first is pressure. Um, that could be personal, typically is personal pressure. You have some sort of motivation. There's an urgent financial need if it's a financial fraud. Um, second is rationalization. So this is where someone justifies uh, a particular action for various reasons. Um, say a person feels underpaid could be a reason that they are able to justify the um, fraud of theft in time, which I would say as a side note, time theft is probably the most common form of fraud in a government entity. Um, our human resources department oversees the timekeeping system. And uh, anyway, that's kind of a side note. And then the opportunity also. So if an opportunity presents itself, uh, say you handle cash and there's very little oversight and the other two components exist where you have significant financial pressure and you can justify it, when all of those things are present, um, the risk of fraud increases substantially. So what the reason that I bring this up uh, is because the fraud risk assessment essentially addresses only one of these areas. What it's doing is it's trying to remove the opportunity um, for an employee of a government entity to commit fraud. So there's checks and balances in place. There's separation of duties. There's a lot, As you read through the fraud risk assessment, there's a lot of things that are done to reduce the opportunity for fraud. For fraud. Another thing that we do interestingly enough, um, indirectly, is through uh, our compensation plan and addressing that on a regular basis that can, that can in part um, address the rationalization because again, theft of time is the most common form of fraud in city government. I put this up, this is a terrible slide and I apologize. This is the scoring matrix uh, or the scoring, the, the assessment itself. And I wanted to go over each of those, each of these, just so that we can have a general idea of what we're looking at here. So the second page of the attachment of the fraud risk assessment is this, the, these, the baseline 200 points. Is it, it's that basic separation of duties, absolutely critical. Um, there's so many small government entities, you know, the city of Moab really struggles with some of our separation of duties. We have a few mitigating controls in place. Um, but there's entities much smaller than ours that even have a more difficult time with that. So this is the most important kind of baseline function of the fraud risk assessment. Number two is all of the policies that are that the um, state auditor's office recommends that we have in place, you know, conflict of interest, procurement, that sort of thing. Third refers to the management team itself. Um, if the entity has a licensed or certified expert as part of the management team. Um, again, this is kind of putting more credit to somebody who has a vested interest in ensuring their professional integrity, I think is part of the idea there, as well as the knowledge of fraud and how to detect it and what to watch out for. Um, similar with 3A, 
in that a member of the management team has a bachelor's degree in accounting. Um, number four, this is something that we do, and this is our, uh, uh, as part of our policies, is that all employees and elected officials are required annually to commit in writing, to commit to a statement of ethical behavior. This comes out um, every year. We have the opportunity to complete that. It's a fun process. Um, there are online trainings within four years of, of uh, an appointment or election date that are that is required on the state auditor's office. And then number six also refers to the management team where one employee is required to complete 40 hours of formal training. This is why we go to conferences. Well, this isn't the only reason, but going to conferences accomplishes this. Um, a fraud hotline, this is a question that came up as to how the city promotes our fraud hotline. Our fraud hotline is essentially the state auditor's office. They are willing and able to serve as that function for local governments. Currently, we advertise that through our policies and procedures manual. Um, again, because this is uh, primarily directed at employees or board members. And so that's the purpose of that. The, um, it, the state auditor's office did recommend that that be published on a website. And so we will be doing that as well. Um, just so that when it's searched, it's clear on how to, how to do that. The internal audit function is number eight. That is completed by the finance director. Internal audit function is one of the roles of the finance director. And the audit committee, this is one that we're very familiar with as we recently created an audit committee, um, which in turn re reduced that um, score in the fraud risk assessment uh, from low to very low. So that's how we accomplished that for this year. There was also a question regarding the city's mitigating controls. There are three. So mitigating controls are less than ideal um, because really what you want to do is have all of those duties separated. Um, but there are three functions within the city that we have mitigating controls in lieu of a separation of duties, simply because primarily this is related to a treasurer's office um, and of being, you know, a staff of three. So the first is that are all people who are able to receive cash or check payments different from the people who are able to make general ledger entries. This is critical because if somebody who is able to receive cash has the ability to adjust a journal, a GL entry, they can correct that in the back end and make it quite difficult to see how that would, it's easy to cover up if a person's able to make general ledger entries. Um, for example, as the finance director, I'm actually not able to receive cash or check payments. Um, and that's because I do a lot of the back end journal entries. Um, but we do have, there's one person in the treasurer's office who's able to do both. And we mitigate that through a review of all general ledger entries made that I don't make personally. Um, it's also good to know that we recently switched accounting softwares within the last six months. And the number of people that are able to make those entries has been significantly diminished. Um, again, the, the next one is also is similar. Are all the people who are able to collect cash or check payments different from the people who are able to adjust customer accounts? So the difference here is that adjusting customer accounts versus general ledger entries. General ledger entries are um, more difficult to detect, I would say, but being able to adjust customer accounts happens much more frequently. So on one hand, you know, one is maybe easier to cover up, but more diff the other one is, is more common. And again, this is just a review of customer adjustments by the finance director. That's the mitigating control. And lastly, is related to our payables process, our original credit purchase card statements received directly from the card company by someone other than the cardholder, if no credit. So this one is, uh, again, so all of the mitigating controls are a, a third party review by the finance director because one, you know, two of them occur in the treasurer's department, one occurs in our recorder's office, and essentially both are simply reviewed. I get a monthly reminder every month to run a report that has me looking at all those to look for inconsistencies. So with that said, I'm happy to present the broad risk assessment for 2023, in which the city scored very low. Great. Thanks, Ben. Questions for Ben. All right. Thank you. You'll Thank be you back. Much. Yep. Summer, did you mention the fact that our internet's slow? Did I hear you say that? I, I tried to. 
okay, I forgot to let everybody know that there was an accident in town. And so because of that, we're kind of running on like backup internet. internet. Yeah. So hopefully we won't have any problems, but just wanted you to know your internet might be a little slow. Um, so technical difficulties may arise. Hopefully not. All right. Alexi is up to talk to us about EV charging stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me get the presentation up and shared. Okay. Um, here we go. Uh, so today I have an update on the existing EV chargers uh, and opportunities for new ones. So first I'll talk about the level two chargers that are already existing and what we're doing uh, to make them function better and also what we might do to expand that. And then I'll talk about uh, fast charging, which also could be coming to Moab. Okay, quick recap. Uh, Moab has some chargers already. It came through a Rocky Mountain Power Grant in 2017. Five were installed. Two of them are on, are owned and operated by the city. The others are owned, or they're owned by the city. We're transferring ownership and they are operated by private landowners. Um, each one has dual port. They're level two. They do about 6.7 kilowatt hour, uh, kilowatt, sorry, power. Um, and that, equals about 20 miles of charging per hour. Uh, they've had functionality issues. So uh, I'm gonna go over some of the plans to address that. Um, they've been kind of a ongoing thing since I started. We updated them to work on 4G, 5G uh, networks, which lets us get data from them. And it also provides the opportunity to charge people, although they're currently free. Um, um, however, two of the four ports, one on each station, one at the golf course and one at City Hall are not functional. So we have two working ports, one here and one at the golf course. Um, you can see uh, that in these, this is kind of a, just a chart of or what we're seeing on the functioning station and one of the, the least functioning station. So um, here the city, the center street side of the station here is being used not quite half the time, um, whereas the ones that are not functional have some variation on this where they're basically uh, not possible to use most of the time. Hmm. Um, the one here is sometimes functional, so it's somewhere in the middle of these two. Um, so this is over three months, 240 transactions on our most active charger. Uh, the reason why we've been kind of going over the options that we have is because there are a lot out there. Um, so when we started looking at fixing the not functional stations, uh, SimiConnect, that's the current provider, uh, requested that we mail in the stations. And if we had to continuously maintain them by doing that, that leads to a lot of downtime, which is impractical in the long run. So I started looking at more options. I consulted with Utah Clean Cities, uh, the state, other cities and vendors. Uh, the possibilities are a mix and match of a lot of different things. Um, and these are just examples of options I found and how they would distribute responsibilities. So we currently have an owner operator type model where the city owns our equipment and we operate it, we maintain it, we provide electricity. Currently we aren't charging for that, it's free. Um, and we just pay for networking or kind of the user interface that would let us charge. And that also lets us see the data of how many people are using it, how much electricity, so forth. Um, there are other options in between here and it kind of shifts um, as pay for service um, for different things. So you can pay for software, you can pay for a warranty, you can pay for a management contract for people to come and maintain it. Within those, you can set the amount of uptime that's required, like you can set that as a parameter of the contract, all the way over to electric vehicle charging as a service, um, which is instead of adding costs in order to usually as a monthly or annual fee pay for services, um, you completely shift the responsibility over and it becomes more of a licensing or a lease agreement in which the city owns the property and somebody else does everything else. 
uh, that does take away the cost of doing it for the city, but it does have some trade-offs. Um, charging, the, the price of the charging then becomes the choice of the operator. Um, and it also lets the operator remove the charging of the structure if it's not producing the revenue that's required. Um, so what we're doing with this is uh, putting out a request for proposals, um, looking at kind of a flexible, uh, it is flexible in what kinds of requests would qualify, mm -hmm. um, letting people propose different types of ownership and responsibility uh, distributions. <laughs> this could include low cost options, no cost options. Um, people could provide more than one option and we could choose. Um, for ones that are uh, pricing the electricity, it requests that the pricing is within 20% of market and less than the equivalent of buying <laughs> fossil fuel to fuel a vehicle. Um, and then the locations that we're looking at are addressing both of the existing stations, either managing those or replacing them so they're functional, and looking at some of the new locations that are going to be stubbed out in the dispersed parking. Uh, so looking at if we can provide additional charging in one or more of those locations. So that is what we're looking at for level two charging. And then for fast charging, uh, we are working on a license agreement with Rocky Mountain Power. Moab, uh, as I mentioned, I think a few months ago, is a priority location for NEPI funding. So uh, Rocky Mountain Power would own and maintain, operate uh, infrastructure. We're looking at Lions Park. However, this plan is not complete. It would be four stalls, including ADA accessibility, and there could be potential for future expansion if there's demand there, including possibly like a pull through spot. Uh, the, their goal is to complete this by fall, given that the contracts have been kind of slow, it could be delayed, uh, but at that point we would have fast charging in Moab. And the new thing for us right now is currently there's no fast charging available that's not for Tesla vehicles. So at this point, it, this would be something any V charger or like any v vehicle could use. Um, so I, that is just the progress update and uh, I am happy to come back and keep you updated as this goes on. Uh, but for now, are there any questions? Questions? I have, I have a question. Um, yeah. Do we have a cost of like what the city is paying to maintain and cost of the electricity we're paying? We don't have the cost of electricity. Um, however, the chargers aren't used a lot. So it's, the electricity is not extremely expensive. Uh, I believe we are paying something like $240 a year per station. Okay. $240 per year for the cost, but that's not for the- That's not for the electricity. That would be for a SEMA Connect and the networking costs okay. charges. Um, Go ahead. Why Lions Park instead of somewhere in town? Mm-hmm. Uh, Lions Park, and maybe Carly can speak to this too, this was part of some discussions uh, between where the electricity is available, um, where the space is available, because having level two or level three fast chargers requires more infrastructure than just the charger. And like uh, level two, it kind of involves something much larger, taking up more space. So we were looking at places uh, where there are bathrooms and places to stop, but also places where people, like we could install stuff that was larger. Um, which made like dis dispersed parking, for example, more difficult and where the electricity was available. I think uh, this is a spot that seemed to make the most sense from our engineering department and others involved. We talked about it a couple, we met with Rocky Mountain a few months ago about this and we talked about different locations. We talked about Emma Boulevard parking lot so that people can walk to town and have lunch and so I don't know that Lions Park is set in stone, but it seemed to be the most practical for people driving through town that wanted to get charged up. It, it is, I think it is set in stone. I mean, if we sign it, right. it would be in that agreement. Okay. My other, um, anyway, anything else, Caitlin? Well, my concern is that it can take an hour or two to charge. And so it's kind of a long time to be right. hanging out at Lions Park. Right. And if, and it, there's potentially an economic development tie-in and if it's convenient for people to patronize local businesses easily. Yeah. Not even though it's fast, it's not that fast. fast. It's not that fast. Right. So 
forward. So if the so Rocky Mountain Power had to at their um, office, correct? Had to. They had uh, a faster their office that uh, they said, from my understanding, is obsolete and they're not planning on repairing. Okay. Um, that will lead into my next question. Um, do you, it seems like, like there's a crowdsourced information on the internet because like I was recently doing, <laughs> I was considering running an EV and just trying to figure out like, does this work logistically? And it seemed like one of the better sources of information was a website called PlugShare, um, which is sort of crowdsourced information where people tell each other mm -hmm. what's broken, what's not, because, or even up to the minute, what's in use um, if, the, if the plugs are networked. But um, I wonder if some official information so that, um, like on the Rocky Mountain Power, so it does. It currently says it's under repair. Uh -huh. So, like, I wonder if you or Rocky Mountain Power could provide like slightly more authoritative information, and that would go into useful this website. for mm -hmm. um, the traveling public. Yes. And then, have you communicated? I know it seems like Tesla is being a little bit tight-lipped about their plans, but they are apparently planning to make quite a few of their chargers um, accessible to other vehicles. Um, have you asked them if they have that intention for Moab? I have not, but I can. Great, thank you. Luke? Yeah, with that, I know they've started rolling them out or across the country, but don't think that they're planning on doing everybody should be nice to know that and then how much uh kilowatt hours did the functional charger use in that three month period on that report oh let me check uh four thousand four hundred and eighty over three months and it, that includes june so okay. not the full month for june all right, so I did some digging into this like a year ago, and I think Ben let me know that we're at like 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So that one charger is probably like $440 like, <laughs> over that period of time. That sounds right, and that is our most used charger. Questions, anybody else? Ronnie. Um, so Alexi, thanks. Um, is it possible to just get your slides after yes. fact? Okay, cool. And the other thing was, um, obviously you never know who's gonna respond, but do you have like a, a time window in mind for the RFP? Uh, it is already written. I'm mm -hmm. going, we're gonna review it. It'll probably be out next week. Okay. Something like that. Okay. Next and then under the so. best of circumstances, you might get responses in the following oh, month or two. The, or... the goal would be that we would have responses in July um, and hopefully have some kind of contract in August. Um, I do have a couple of people reviewing that right now. Um, and it'll also probably depend on how that fits in with the dispersed parking and you know construction as to when that would make sense for it to happen. Um, but it, it could happen within three or so months. Okay, cool, thanks. All right. Thanks, Alexi. One clarification, Carly, is my understanding is the Rocky Mountain Power um, fast chargers is a 10 year, is a 10 year agreement. And then after the 10 years, the city takes it over. I can't remember the details here. It was about 10 years because that's part of their pilot program. Right. So they're operating in a, under a specific schedule where they're allowed to pilot this program. So it'd be during the term of the program, it's roughly 10 years. And I think we had negotiated I can't remember what we negotiated after that 10 year program. I think that we have the option to the extend. Option. Yeah. Okay, good. Because my understanding also is the most expensive part is the maintenance and mm -hmm. when they, you know, when they break down. Yeah, we might not want to take them on. Right, you know, exactly. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, Alexi. More to come on this, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we have um, two items on our consent agenda, the approval of the minutes from May 23rd, 2023 regular meeting and approval of the bills against the city of Moab in the amount of $445,336.55. So I have a motion. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. 
All right, motion by Tawny. Second. Second by Kaylin. Any discussion, Tawny? Nope. Kaylin? Nope. Anybody else? All in favor of consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. All right, now we move on to our, our public hearing. We have a public hearing this evening for ordinance 2023-10, an ordinance of the City Council of Moab annexing the Shamrock Properties XX LLC property at approximately 1480 South Highway 191 to the city of Moab and assigning um, the zone of C4 general commercial to the parcel. Now, I do not see Corey. Oh, you're right there, Corey. <laughs> Sorry, no wonder I didn't see you. I wasn't looking down. Anyway, we're going to start off this public hearing with a briefing from staff. And then we are going to have Ellen Weinstein, who's here from Shamrock to talk to you about her project, and then we'll open the public hearing for public comment. So uh, take it away, Corey. And Nathan is also here if we have any questions for him. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for sake of time, and I know we have intensity with the connection, so I will move through the presentation pretty quick, but as always, I'm open to moving back through if we have additional questions or need clarification on some of these aspects. As this is a dynamic, um, item will certainly slow down when needed. Um, but because of the history for almost um, over a year now, um, I'm hoping we're mostly familiar with this process. So um, the quick overview of essentially where we're at, this was a framework that we had presented early on, which is a simplified aspect of flowchart of how the annexation process will flow through. Um, within the packet, we've provided within that background, the framework of dates, from what was the original submittal back in April of 2022 uh, for the original petition, but then actually went back to a pre-annexation agreement, which I believe was approved. Um, I believe it was in November. Yes, November of 2022. Um, so following the pre-annexation agreement, we've moved through the process with uh, the petition accepting by the city council in January, and then moving through the noticing procedures. Um, and then more recently, uh, processing through the boundary commission as there were two objections filed. And we'll get to that a little bit later on uh, the standing of those objections and essentially were uh, not validated as um, qualified objections under that context. So understandably, we have the concerns of those that have petitioned the objection, which is why we're having the public hearing now. This is the time for the public to provide their commentary and concerns surrounding the annexation apart from uh, the filed objection process. So regardless, uh, we processed the debate commission and those objections were dismissed. The planning commission uh, on June 8th uh, issued a positive recommendation <laughs> Sorry, was there a question? No, it was a no, cough. I just coughed. Oh, okay, so sorry. With the audio, it is a little bit uh, digital, so uh, I might ask for a uh, repetition of questions. Um, with the Planning Commission on June 8th forwarding a positive recommendation, um, and then we find ourselves here with the public hearing and possible action at the city council level. This is... A, also, uh, in a historic slide from some of the previous presentations, profiling the steps and timeframes within the noticing procedures of that annexation process. Nathan uh, may later be able to provide some of the specifics of how that annexation had amended previously in the last year and why we were needing to notice in such a uh, robust way compared to um, what had been more a typical annexation petitions directly to the city. Um, but moving on to the specifics of the project here, uh, this vicinity map location shows proximity to the existing city limit boundaries and the identification of the two properties identified as approximately 1480 South Highway 191. Um, but again, that, uh, that addressing with the legal description encompassing both these individual parcels, which upon annexation and upon the site plan development process would be consolidated to represent a single development within a single project. And these are 
excerpt map pieces from our general plan. Uh, they are a bit small. I can try to zoom in, hopefully, to identify generally within the context. We can see this uh, exterior, what is dashed uh, borderline, being our future annexation boundary area. So everything within the context that dashed line being uh, what was part of the general approved plans proposed annexation area. Now, within the future land use area, we also see within that annexation district, the particular uh, planned use areas that would be consistent with the general plan at that approval date. So uh, I won't zoom in too much here, but what we can identify here is that hashed yellow line within this district area, essentially identified as future commercial area, which regarding annexation process and the planning commission's considerations and that strictly kind of tying to zoning specifically. So not so much to particular use, but zoning. And then within that context, any permitted use within that zoning district would have obviously be permitted. So what we're looking at today is um, consistent with the pre-annexation agreement of a C4 uh, district designation. Specifically that was attached within the pre-annexation agreement was the proposed use of property to contextualize what it is the anticipated site, site plan submission would include, which was essentially a multi-household uh, apartment project in addition to a just north of 6,000 square foot uh, commercial mixed use, both, you know, loosely proposed as retail and possible eating establishment. Now, these particular components aren't profiled in, as far as commercial goes, in the pre-annexation. However, the residential component is specific, specifically contextualized in that pre-annexation agreement. And we'll go through that in just a moment. Um, what we're seeing in this slide, and again, I'm sure it's very small in the chambers here. I'll try to zoom in the best I can without, um, losing frame, oh, just like that, is the uh, zone to zone comparison of the existing zone of both properties as highway commercial within the Grand County uh, jurisdiction, comparing with what is the proposed zoning or what would be our most consistent zoning, which is a C4 general commercial zone. Uh, when we get into the discussion about pros and cons in just a little bit, we're likely gonna be identifying a couple components. One of those is height, density, as well as buffering requirements. In a general statement, I'd say these two are pretty uh, equal in framework, I'd say within our height context and density being the most uh, bit of a jump. The screening and buffering is fairly consistent with each other. Ours is maybe a little bit more substantial. Um, our setbacks are a little bit more substantial, but our density is greater and our height is also greater by uh, those increments that we can see within these uh, matrix here. See if I can zoom out enough. Okay, um, this is maybe where we might slow down just for a little bit is to assess the pros and cons. Part of, I think, both the original uh, review back in January, there were statements about the analyzing of the actual annexation itself versus the legal parameters of accepting the petition. This is the uh, appropriate stage in which the council can review these and discuss the actual validity of uh, accepting uh, or approving rather the annexation. So within the pros section to begin with, and this was, a, I think, um, a compilation of a staff report, as well as commentary from the public that we've gotten of what would be the culmination of the pros and cons here. On the pro side, the, these pre-annexations specifically with annexation processes allow negotiations and coordinations with developers to bring in desirable uses uh, under appropriate standards to the city jurisdiction. It's one of the limited frameworks of zoning tools that we have to actually engage with developers to uh, design a compatible use within the city outside of what would just be a um, zone assessment. So specifically within this project, uh, the pre-annexation confirms that that mixed use development of a multi-household use as well as commercial 
uh, would construct not less than 72 residential units, of which that 50% shall be designated as AEH to for a 50-year term. To expand that a little bit further, that 72 units as it's proposed now would be apartment structures, which are rental by uh, ownership nature, therefore more than likely being at a market rate, meaning local uh, rental threshold and fluctuating with mar market rates of the community for all 72 units. But of those 72, the 36 will be secured for that 50 years as not just local market rate, but as workforce housing. So if the ownership uh, design of that property from apartments ever does convert to say condominiums or some other type of ownership structure, those 36 will maintain their uh, market relevance as AEH. Now, uh, an additional pro is within the advanced general plan, the future annexation area and future land use area plan. This is what could have been viewed as a, a, a pro or a con from a planning perspective. This is certainly a pro uh, of what we're seeing is within this annexation it is bringing the city into more compliance within what the general plan was as the future annexation area plan and also the land use area plan. And by that, I mean that this is a redevelopment site. So with the current use proposed to change, this development will be brought into city standards, both uh, infrastructure and um, within the zoning parameters for, for the construction itself, in that if a later date this property were annexed post-construction, there may be a, a multitude of elements that would be legal non-conforming. So right off the bat, we are into a strained uh, development situation for the, the, the owners. Uh, for any adjustments to that use. So if it is redeveloping under this pre-annexation context and meeting with these general plan standards, it's actually a pro uh, from the long-term big picture planning perspective. Uh, in addition to that, the last pro we were wanting to profile was the reliable forecast of the proposed development. Uh, with this development, we're essentially, as it's going through pre-annexation, certainly the development could uh, not move forward. Uh, but if it moves forward, it's moving forward under a guaranteed forecast of the proposed uh, standards that we're securing through that pre-annexation, which is of the two things proposed is local and workforce housing by the terms of uh, market rate apartments and then AEH specifically at that high percentage rate. And then commercial opportunity, which we're also finding to be more and more of an essential need. I know we're all very familiar with the housing crisis, but the dual side of this coin that continues to flip is a sustainable community that depends on local economic development, specifically within commercial opportunities, gearing away, I would say, from singular resource or highest best use practices, which I know I'm not diminishing anybody's uh, contributions to our, our resource, which is tourism, um, but that isn't going to maintain a community sustainable system. And so um, what we're seeing is the opposite opposition to this is if we brought it into the city, we're getting guaranteed terms. If we were to deny this and it were to develop out in the city, because that's another context that we have to understand here is that this property will develop. It, it is at this point of a high enough value that the status quo will not maintain Therefore, we're having to assume highest and best use capacities of return for the property owner, no matter where jurisdictionally they're building. So within that, we could be getting workforce housing and some commercial opportunity, or within, if we were to pop back up to that permitted use table, everything from a manufacturing plant to a gas station to uh, ATV rentals, um, other outfitters. So the... Um, non-secure development option has significantly less benefit to the community and specifically to the city than it does having the secured forecast of the development that we have through the pre annexation Now, transitioning over to the cons, um, these have been taken mostly from context of discussions uh, within the community, particular objection protests um, and commentary. We at the Planning Commission did not receive any public commentary at that time, uh, so we have nothing to add to the public hearing at this point. 
Um, but some of the most termed points were the commercial to residential intensity boundary. Uh, this was brought up a number of times that the C4 zone is now abutting directly adjacent to an RR county zoning of rural residential. Uh, what could be perceived as one of the highest commercial uses to a low density or lower density use within the uh, county jurisdiction. That's undoubtedly one of the cons to moving this forward. But I think uh, as included in this table, we would have to acknowledge that as the C4 zoning is the most equivalent to highway commercial, this uh, residential commercial intensity boundary already exists. It already exists intact as it is. So again, like I was saying, the development standards within the city, there are some uh, more intense components and less intense in, excuse me, intense components, meaning we have uh, larger screening and buffering requirements. We have larger setbacks, but we do have increased height and increased density. Um, so those are obviously considerations that council will want to uh, review. The additional con is county services for city jurisdiction development. Now, this was a, a comment that we got from council pre-meeting to staff of how this was actually going to be articulated. Is this going to be an issue with uh, the Grand Water and Sewer Service Agency, GWISA, maintaining water and sewer services for this development, despite it not being uh, being in the city and then being serviced by county services, if we want to consider it that way. Um, now, that it, that certainly is a consideration. However, I would note, and I think Chuck had contributed to Pete's, uh, Chuck Williams, our city engineer, had contributed to that response, which is that we, through the, the Valley, coordinate with this actively on many developments. Um, there are a number of properties that are within the city limits or adjacent city jurisdiction that have this mixed component. We actually have some developments that have city water and county sewer or vice versa. So um, we have agents from the GWISA board that are actually uh, attendants on our development review team DRT process. So we coordinate closely and consistently with GWISA that that is not, I think, uh, of a major concern from a development perspective and maintenance perspective uh, from staff level. And then the last challenge that was brought up was uh, with connectivity and access. This uh, development, as it's obviously increasing in density and potential traffic for both residents and patrons um, within this area and um, intersection could create some challenges for the community surrounding it. And then as well as the citizens and patrons themselves. Um, I apologize, there's some dogs in here. Um, the contributing piece I'd like to add to that is that the UDOT and Utah Unified Master Transportation Plan is um, working on a coordinated plan within this area, both for a um, intersection light at that Aggie Boulevard and Highway 191 or Mill Creek intersection junction to, I think, uh, bring a little bit more of a consolidated pattern as well as additional uh, pathways for patrons and commuters to access the city that's in this high traffic area at a high speed. So with this additional light and frontage, planned frontage area um, will probably provide additional amenity or mitigation to those services. Uh, there are some additional maps here and I'll do the best I can to zoom in. So this first one uh, is identifying, this was taken off our Google GIS mapping system that has uh, different uh, overlay systems. So what we're seeing here is within the city jurisdiction, the zoning boundaries are the different colorations of the parcels. And then you might see this independent line fixture from center line of Highway 191 to the boundary of what is uh, the C4 zone and the adjacent R2 or single household and two household residential zone, yeah. which is not, I'd say the equivalent of the RR, but is one of the city's lower density zones, is the distance of that span of what we'd call that commercial block or district piece is about 700 feet. And we can see that consistently brought down through this area as what would maybe from a city's perspective be an appropriate jurisdictional area of 
uh, maybe not full blocks in Moab. We don't really consider that, especially out of the typical uh, town site area, the historic town site area. Um, but th that becomes a functioning developable district for those commercial properties. Now, within this next slide, what we're seeing is the same line drawn off of the center of Highway 191, uh, perpendicular, so trying to be as uh, consistent as possible there, at a, about the same rate, 700 feet. And what we'd see at that rate is that that distance would, I think, appropriately encapsulate both of these two properties, as well as additionally up into some of the, the higher properties up on the hill. My... Um, point that I think we're trying to, from a staff perspective, make is that with the highway situated the way it is and almost planned for expansions of traffic and, and use, that rather than trying to reduce down intensities closer to the highway, is that maintain the what seems to be district appropriate separations from the highway of a viable commercial use. And then maybe rather than down zoning these areas, is the potential for up zone or increased use opportunities for those residential properties uphill. So obviously there's jurisdictional boundaries because we're so close. Within Moab, we're so tight together that it is hard to make appropriate zoning buffering districts. So going from high commercial to medium to low commercials to high density residential, medium density to low. We just don't have that span unless we are half zoning, uh, which was some of what the uh, county jurisdiction did along the highways off of center line, essentially did a static zone district off the center line of the highway, regardless of parcel districts, which makes it pretty challenging for developers to, to manage a split zone property, single parcel, let alone a jurisdiction of parcels and how those interact. Um, so uh, while I'm not implying that these historic neighborhoods or historic residential properties need to upzone or need to become apartments. I think what we're just trying to balance is how to make things within our very small community work in a way that is a practical practice. Um, additionally, this zoning map, it, it may be hard to see, is a, a linear path uh, measurement. So from that Southern aspect of the city jurisdiction, which is, um, Right here, this is the South Maverick, if you can see my cursor floating. And then there's some additional Southern properties uh, coming out that are C4. From that point down to the property itself is approximately three quarters of, an, three quarters of a mile separation from what would be the, the base Southern rim of our city jurisdiction. Now, obviously there are some additional properties within the county jurisdiction on that West side reaching further up. Uh, the highway. However, already we are starting to see pre-annexation proposals and annexation proposals for some of these uh, properties along the south side of, of the highway. So again, <laughs> filling in this annexation boundary area. And then within this next slide, what we're showing is kind of midpoint of the subject properties and their separation from that intersection area. Speaking back towards connectivity, um, this distance of just about 1500 feet gives, I think this project enough run from this intersection that they're not gonna have immediate implications from the light or turning lane intersections of that, what will likely be a major intersection. So it gives them enough room to um, turn and hopefully access lanes both left and right. I think we all know if we're on the south side of the highway or west side of the highway, trying to make a left turn at this point, uh, even year round is incredibly challenging, but within this property, with the turning lanes, they would be able to achieve appropriate circulation to certainly right turn and then left turn on Mill Creek and access the community that way, or potentially even left turn into a shared turning lane and access uh, a northbound route. Within the motion, this is, um, I think, consistent with what was approved in the packet. The only identification that we're showing is just for consistency purpose to establish the uh, addressing the way it was originally petitioned. Uh, of course, the legal boundaries are all intact and fully sound, but um, the address is approximately 1480 is consistent and accurate. I will go ahead and stop sharing screen. Uh, and I think that will conclude my piece during this briefing period. I really appreciate your patience. That was a long span of information. 
I, I think Nathan, if you want to jump in now or wait to the discussion, um, I think Mayor, you had suggested maybe the applicant have a, a component for contributions. Corey, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add right now, so I'll just wait. Okay. For the Did you say you're going to? You'll wait. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we'll have Ellen come up and and provide her testimony, and then we'll open up to public hearing, and then we will move to consideration and you guys can ask all your questions at that time. Um, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Ellen Weinstein. I'm the CEO of Shamrock Communities. Um, I founded Shamrock in 2010 to buy foreclosures from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac during the financial crisis. Um, between 2010 and 2015, we bought 6,000 apartment units around the country and repositioned very tough properties um, and eventually sold them in 2018. But I have a lot of experience working with city councils and police departments on repositioning tough properties and, you know, finding ways to serve communities' needs. Um, since 2018, we started developing properties. So we now have a thousand apartment units in Utah, Indiana, and Kentucky. And we have another 1,200 units in the design or development phase. Um, they're all workforce housing product. They're typical, typical of the structures you see here. They're three-story walk-ups, um, some, you know, some basic amenities uh, and, um, you know, basic appliance packages. But they're really, the purpose of them is to serve the needs of the people who are working in the community. Um, and I'm sure you're all very aware that there's a there's a dearth of workforce housing in Moab right now. In typical cities, the the ratio of apartment units to um, population is typically one apartment unit unit to ten people, which in the greater Moab area would translate into about a thousand workforce housing apartment units that are needed. And um, rental housing is a really important part of the housing cycle. And um, especially in the leisure, leisure community where you have a lot of people coming in on a seasonal basis to work, rental housing is a very important component. Um, our project is, uh, is as it's proposed right now, is a mix of one and two bedroom units. And some of the two bedroom units will have a den, which can also be used as a third bedroom. Um, and as Corey has explained, 50% of the units will be designated for locally employed people, which requires at least one of the occupants to be employed in Grand County on a full-time basis. Um, we feel that this is a, you know, an important start to helping the community serve, you know, finding housing for the local, you know, local business, for the employees of the local businesses. And, um, the architecture, you know, as the project evolves, the architecture will be, you know, con consistent with the rest of the um, architect new architecture of the city. So um, I look forward to working with everyone. I, you know, if you have any specific questions about the project, I'm happy to answer it. I feel like Corey's probably given a lot of the details already that I might have already shared with you. Great. Thanks, Ellen. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open this to the public. I want you all to know that Matt and Lisa Cineros uh, gave their comments um, of opposition in writing. Um, so you should have access to those. And then I think, um, Kathy, are you gonna speak? Am I? You need to open the public hearing. Oh. time. Okay. Let me just do this. I'm going to open the public hearing for public comment at seven o'clock p.m. And Kathy Holyoke, um, if you wouldn't mind coming up, stating your name and your address, and then we will um, allowing three minutes of public comment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Holyoke, and uh, I am not opposed to the annexation of this. I actually would kind of encourage it because it will become part of the city. What I am concerned about, though, is the access and those of you that have the maps that were sent out and I've googled earth that is and I'm surprised that there aren't more of them here although 
I understand why they aren't, because <laughs> some of them are handicapped, but uh, access to the above residences, above these two parcels, the triangle and the, the, the square. Um, when you Google Earth that, um, I, I don't have any computer thing, but it just shows where the road comes up. And they're actually accessing their homes on property that is owned by Sitla, uh, which was land that was originally gifted by my mother and father-in-law, Ray and Ruth Holyoke to Utah State University. And then it was traded to Sitla. And so that upper piece and the piece where the college is, uh, this original piece was of 20 acres was Utah State, then they traded it for Sitla. But anyway, that road that goes into those upper homes is right next to that. And I'm just concerned. I mean, I haven't seen any development because it's not public yet, but I'm just concerned of their access and our access as well, because at some future point in time, as they pointed out, I think all of this upper area will eventually be zoned into the city. I think, uh, and I have seen plans because <clears throat> I'm part of, well, I'm not part of the development, but up above that, just below the college so you access the college and immediately to the right before you get to the college there is going to be a, a road and you may have seen it I haven't been part of that but there's a whole bunch of other apartments planned on that state trust lands so again I guess my main concern is the road access for these residences and that road will eventually become a, an access to my upper 20 acre parcel and 40 acre parcel, which the 40 acre actually comes behind. I, I can only explain it as Dana Jean Holyoke's place, but I am concerned about, they are not encroaching on that road away, right away, but I just wanna make sure that that remains open and that there's an understanding that this is a future access to my property on that straight state trust lands I have deeds and everything to from that from Utah State and from state trust lands and just to make sure that any development that happens along there they're aware that this needs to be remained open so thanks Kathy thank you Ellen do you have a new response uh, right now there's two points of ingress and ingress to the site this ingress on the Northern part will also serve the parcel that's um, directly north to us, and the ingress ingress on the southern part. Um, there will be an easement that will allow the uh, neighbors who live behind the property to drive them to the property. So we've already agreed. To <laughs> that. Great, thanks, Ellen. Any other comments? All right. I will close the public hearing at 7.04 p.m. And we will move on to item 6.2, consideration of adoption of ordinance 2023-10 and ordinance approving the annexation of property located at 1480 South Highway 191 Moab, Utah 84532. Council, questions? I have, I have a question. I just kind of I'm kind of curious um, what the thought process is with only wanting to do 50 percent as um, active employment housing instead of 100 um, percent. And you could you uh, come up, Ellen, so that you're on the mic? Yes. Yeah, we had actually originally proposed 33 percent, and I think the counter was 50 percent. Um, my expectation is that it will probably be 100% workforce housing uh, or locally employed people. I mean, those are, that's the demographic that would likely be renting the apartments. Um, the leases will be one-year leases. So they're, they're not short-term <laughs> leases. So our, thought, our expectation is that they, we will end up with 100% actively employed. But um, part of the... Uh, difficulty as a developer is when you get financing is having a restrictive covenant that you know is, is in excess of 50 percent will make it more difficult to get financing the construction and permit financing for the project 
So I believe that we ultimately decided on the 50% was reasonable. We did discuss more than 50. I think the answer was the fight. Was yeah, I just, I just remember when it first started, um, it was going to be 100, but then, you know, um, or that was the intention of it and stuff. And I, and I guess I can understand that from somewhat from a financing point of view and stuff. I was just kind of curious. Um, yeah. We did, didn't we actually talk to in, some lending institutions to get their feedback yeah. to validate right. that? All right. And that was part of the discussion for ADH too. So mm -hmm. it was, this was happening at the same time. Right. So okay. we're kind of getting that consistent info. Right. Is that what you have found with some of your other developments is that if they have a restrictive covenant on them, that they still, you still end up with 100% workforce housing? Well, this is the first time we've done a restrictive covenant, oh, but okay. but um, yes, I mean it is it is designed, you know, by nature to be one year leases and for you know locally employed people or people who are in transition who have moved into an area waiting to buy a house or have sold a house and are waiting to move into another house. Um, people are just coming out of college, but that's sort of the the demographic for workforce housing. And you don't you don't find that there is a us versus them mentality if the people that are in the workforce units versus the other one it does do they integrate pretty well yeah I mean I, I most residents aren't typically socializing with each other too I mean we won't we the the site isn't actually large enough to have a community of um, a clubhouse so um no I, I don't I don't foresee an issue with it I just kind of were curious, like there's no intention of taking the other 50% and condominiumizing them, you know, no. um, you know, or so they go on the yeah. open market. No, I mean, that's, um, well, it, that's not our business model. Okay. We strictly do rental housing. We strictly do workforce housing. I think an issue that came up a number of times was this concern that they, we would be renting units, the 50% the of the units, or the other 50% of the units would be rented to people who were just coming on the weekends to, you know, partake in the um, facility, you know, in the outdoor activities in the lab. Um, but it's, it's, that's unlikely to happen because typically when we go through a rental process and credit verification, you know, we ask for employer, you know, pay stubs and employer recommendations and prior landlord recommendations. So it would, it, just, you know, ultimately preclude most people from coming in and just renting. Plus, these are one-year leases, and we don't allow subletting. So, the, um, there, the, the other concern I think that came up often was this fear of having it become an Airbnb. But it's again, it's not our business model. We wouldn't allow other pe people to rent and use that as a, you know, as a business for, you know, we'll, we'll be closely monitoring it. So are all of the leases uh, on the property going to be one-year leases? Yeah, that's um, standard. I guess like my question with that is like your acknowledgement of the fact that there's a lot of like seasonal workers that come here for like six to eight months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm concerned that if there's only one-year leases available, that it might dissuade those individuals that really kind of um, have, I think, some of the highest degrees of like housing shortages in our community. Um, aren't going to want to sign up for something that that might potentially be on the hook for like a remaining six to like four months of the lease, particularly when subletting isn't allowed. So I was just wondering what kind of like considerations have been taken in regards to the makeup of like the workforce within Moab. So we were allowing shares so people can come in and you can have more than one person on the lease agreement and but they but the other person, that's some between them. So if somebody moves out, they will need to find another person. And then that person will have to go through our application and credit process to make sure they're a viable tenant. But but the units are designed to um, accommodate, you know, uh, shorter people who intend to be here for shorter periods of time. Okay. And then is there going to be on-site like property management or? Yeah. Yeah, so there'll be a leasing office. It's a it's a small building. Um, it's less than a thousand square feet. There'll be a leasing office, maintenance shop, and you know, coffee bar and mailroom, basically. 
what are your thoughts on the is the front the retail in the front area mm -hmm. is it gonna um look it's like a restaurant space and a retail space is that the so the soft? we i i believe it's six thousand square feet and approximately half will be retail and half will be in the restaurant and that's mostly has just been determined by the parking um you know the uh parking requirements <clears throat> Oh, Ronnie. Oh, thanks. Um, do you have any way of anticipating um, like how many jobs those um, those retail and restaurant spaces might create? Um, you know, one of the things we have to think about um, is um, uh, uh, you know how how much are we adding um, to uh, the population of people who need who might need housing. So I don't know if you have any way of knowing, like would we be talking maybe another 20 or 30 people who would be looking for housing or do you have any way of knowing? I don't know if there are any uh, formulas for that. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's that's a difficult number. Yeah. To, okay. To okay. Um, that was one of my questions. And then um, let's see. Um, and then I wasn't sure too. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, um, it's great to think that the people who um, live and work here, you know, might be able to use 50% uh, of the units or more. I didn't know, is that based on um, running numbers, kind of looking at the um, at the AMI of our, or the average median income of our residents? I know this isn't have an affordability percentage tied and units will be able to rent for whatever the market will bear. But um, I didn't know, you know, based on what you guys need to pencil out, if looking at, you know, what um, what our students or servers or other uh, residents are making, um, if <laughs> looking at those numbers, what they make a year, um, it looks like they might be able to get into these units for what you guys, yeah, need to make. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I, I don't know what the yeah. uh, median income of the servers or the support staff for the businesses are, but... Mm -hmm. You know these these units at a thousand dollars a month would be affordable to somebody who makes thirty six thousand a year. So that would the typical ratio when 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 we're leasing, um, we would deny anybody whose income is greater whose the rent was greater than thirty three percent of their gross income. Uh -huh. Yeah. So because we would. We want people to move in who can actually afford the rent. Also, we you know we don't like turnover. Okay. So, um, but the thirty three percent is the typical ratio, <laughs> and that would include tips as well. People who work on you know tips or commissions. Um, I was going to ask the mayor. I know you closed the public hearing, but did we officially go into the discussion portion on this item where mm -hmm. we're potentially taking action? Okay. Um, I did have a question. You you mentioned the um, the protest letters that went to the Boundary Commission. I did get the notes from the Boundary Commission, but I didn't actually get those letters. Were those sent out? I can't. You know, I got them months ago. They're in the shared. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't find them in my files today, but they should be there. I'm sure. They are in the shared drive. Too. Yeah. They're okay. In the shared drive. Um, thanks. Okay, um, and then I do, uh, um, sorry, just going through the list. Uh, I'll let someone else ask questions. Anybody else? I don't have any more questions. I just, um, I, we've worked on this for a long time. There's been a lot of, a lot of man hours and a lot of time put into this. And I just want to let everybody know that has worked on it. I appreciate it. Um, that's why we have your expertise. Um, and, you know, for what it's worth, I think the Unified Transportation Master Plan and UDOT do, are kind of compelled to do something because um, construction has begun on a hotel that's exactly just across the highway from this. Mm -hmm. So it's not just this development that will add it, will, that hotel will add um, traffic and human beings and more congestion. So um, in my mind, I'm not figuring out how they're going to get cars up onto the highway from that 
where they're starting now to hell, but I'm not an engineer. So I just wanna thank everybody that was involved in this. Motion. I just had one quick question that's more directed towards city is like, as we're having a lot of these large developments on the horizon and everything, um, I know that we've kind of looked to really increase our policing side, uh, like staffing numbers to accommodate like the impacts from the tourists and everything. Do we have any sort of plans in place to kind of make sure that as Moab continues to grow, that our services and utilities and everything grow to meet the demands of this increased population? Yeah, if you recall, wait, are we doing the public safety at Penn State? Is that on the list? Right. So we're um, engaging with the consultant for public safety in Penn State uh, to accommodate that kind of growth potential for new development coming online. Okay. We do, I mean, a, a development like this is going to be low impact to public safety. And fortunately, it's not impacting our water and sewer, of course, but we have water and sewer impact fees for that reason, if it, if it did. Um, and, you know, the road isn't really ours out in front of it. It's still mm -hmm. Utah, so there's no road. The, those kinds of services are not being expanded. Okay. So pretty low impact and maybe high um, high benefit kind of yeah. project because, it, it, you know. For, yeah, and it, it wasn't necessarily, like, limited to just this project, yeah. but just overall there's a lot coming online or mm -hmm. ideally coming online. Yeah. Who knows what the market's going to be. Yeah. Ronnie. Um, I'd like to make a motion to table until our next meeting, just because we haven't gotten those letters. We just saw the list of pros and cons tonight, and we've been told in the past, I mean, gotten attorney advice that, you know, when you move into the um, uh, actual um, annexation phase is when you should be looking at and discussing pros and cons. This is the first night um, we've discussed that, so we haven't had much time to digest that. Um, and I also um, asked for some information I didn't get yet. Um, well, I guess I was told to go to Gwisa, but I was curious, um, uh, you know, how much water we might be looking at, because while one can say um, that Gwisa is providing the water and sewer, um, it doesn't really work that way because we've discussed that we're in a day and age where we're working collectively in the valley on the water utility resource management plan with the different providers, but collectively we only have so much water left and some of us may have hit um, the point of no return um, in terms of safe yield. So um, a lot of us have asked over and over again over time that while we're um, considering development and annexations are something that we're supposed to take very seriously um, as elected officials, um, uh, that we um, also be watching the bar, and a lot of residents um, have asked for this, um, that we be watching, okay, well, how much water are we using? How much do we think we have? How much have we committed that's in the process um, of being allotted? And how much more are we adding? And um, can you guys please track that as you go so we know where we're at? And I do feel like it would be irresponsible um, to make a decision um, because we seem to go back and forth between this isn't our water, it's the county versus we're all in here collectively. And this pool of 1,300 to 3,500 acre feet that we might have um, is the city and um, the county. And so we can't really have it both ways. Either we're kind of um, uh, discussing collectively um, what we can be doing um, uh, so anyway, I just feel like it would be irresponsible um, to not have that information. And um, I haven't had time to ask Wissa about that. All right, we have a motion to table. Second. Motion dies for lack of second. We have another motion. Um, I'll move that Moab City Council um, approve Moab Ordinance 2023-10, an ordinance approving the annexation of property located at approximately 1480 South Highway 191 in unincorporated Grand County jurisdiction. I'll second that. Motion by Luke, seconded by Jason. Any discussion, Luke? Jason. No, I'd, I'd just like to say that um, as I've read like the letters um, of concern, um, like Cisneros and stuff has some really good points and that they need to be looked at objectively in the future as we as we go in with these annexations, um, you know, and the overall picture, you know, I, I Corey makes a really good point that by annexing this that we can um, 
kind of control of what's happening with this property that we don't have you know a, a tire factory you know going in right there not that we would you know or something in the future but it's something that provides um you know some retail um retail restaurants and but also employee housing which i think is um is is pretty critical and it kind of controls that that district or that commercial district that's there and stuff so um but i do agree that we need to take cisneros heed and create some plans as we go forward in this area and developing this three quarters of a mile heading back towards the city good thanks <clears throat> any other discussion all right i'll call for the vote motion made by luke to um, adopt an ordinance uh 2023-10 an ordinance approving the annexation of property located at 1480 south highway 191 moab utah 84532 that motion was seconded by jason all in favor aye any opposed ronnie opposed motion passes four to one all right ellen thank, thank you. you all right next up we have consideration of adoption of a resolution 18 2023 approving the marcus court minor subdivision property located at 347 marcus court moab utah 84532 this is an administrative um, consideration and Corey, if you want to just take a few minutes to explain this and then we'll turn it over for council for questions sure thank you mayor uh in fact i i because it is an administrative item, we don't have a lengthy presentation, but I think it would be helpful just to share the proposed plat here shortly um, to identify some of the questions that were brought up by council and clarification. We don't typically see uh, minor subdivisions in this context, both in the easement structure and in the articulation of a twin home uh, division. So uh, the lot adjustments here, in fact, um, what we're seeing is that this had not updated correctly. I don't know if I have access to our VPNP drive with the network down at this point. Um, there, there has been an amendment to this plat that identifies the parcels. The um, center line and the meets and bounds are consistent, but what we had through the planning department required is that they identify the existing structure on on this lot so this is not a vacant lot this is a constructed lot as a duplex so it was a single property uh within a single uh subdivision context of a a lot single parcel uh the duplex was developed in line with a twin home style of develop meaning along that center line divided evenly between the lot uh, is a separating wall party wall or demising wall to meet the standards for the separation of, of a future lot division intact that way. Um, what we're additionally seeing is the access and easement location. This Marcus Court is a substandard cul-de-sac. Um, with that, in the proposed development, there were a number of trees within the right-of-way. And in order uh, to maintain as many trees on site in the right-of-way as possible, the proper owner was willing to make amendments. Uh, he had also owned the adjacent parcel, which you can see over onto what would be the left side of that property to allow for emergency access circulation. So otherwise, these lots are, are addressed to the street just as any other subdivision, but because of fire apparatus or the fire truck uh, radial requirements, it's turnaround requirements, uh, it was essential that that access point was able to be uh, maneuvered in a way to get a truck back into those lots, uh, given the substandard cul-de-sac that was never developed uh, during the original development of the subdivision. There were lot by lot public improvements developed. Uh, so that's what we're seeing with, through this parcel is why that easement location has been identified there on top of the public utility easement, which are typically attributed to our service providers for Rocky Mountain Power or Dominion. Um, but yes, the the amended plat does show the existing structures that identify the center line is in the correct location and that the uh, existing structures do meet the setbacks and follow the standard requirements for that division. Questions for Corey? Motion. 
I can make one. Um, I move that the Moab City Council approve Moab City Resolution 18-3, a resolution approving the Marcus Court Minor Subdivision of property located at 347 Marcus Court, Moab, Utah. Motion by Ronnie. Second. I'll second. Second by Tawny. Any further discussion, Ronnie? No. Tawny? No. Anybody else? I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Our last item of business tonight is the consideration of the adoption of a resolution 16 2023, a resolution adopting the fiscal year 23 24 budget. Ben. Okay, so this is the, uh, the culmination, tentatively, culmination of, a, of the six, six month process of the budget adoption. So back into the presentation mode. Doug, could you dig up a <laughs> older picture because I need a haircut. The faux hawk. <laughs> All right. So here we have the budget presentation. <laughs> this is a unicorn of some significance. <laughs> what is a unicorn? What? Look at that. <laughs> I apologize. I've no, I normally try and remain professional. Um, so as I was preparing this, this presentation, uh -huh, one of my daughters was looking over my shoulder. She said, Dad, do you have to use that uh, the, the theme? It's so boring. And I said, well, I mean, it's a budget presentation. It's kind of just boring by nature. And she's, I said, what could I do to make it more interesting? And she said, at a unicorn. <laughs> that makes everything more interesting. It should have been <laughs> so cute. Um, all right. So what we what I try to do in budget presentations is simply to um instead of trying to swallow everything, understand the whole thing, what what I have tried to do is basically um review the changes from the, as you as we go through each version. Uh, there were a number of changes from the tentative budget to the final budget, and I just wanted to go through those kind of one by one so that the council understood the what and the why and how it came about. So there were a couple um, rollover budget items for, and that's this first bullet point. Basically, if something bud is budgeted in a fiscal year and it's not spent, and then it's not rebudgeted for, it essentially becomes fund balance, as long as your revenues are on target. Um, and so what we did here, there were a number of things that are important for us to roll over. In fact, as I'm looking at it, I'm realizing we didn't even catch, uh, one of them was, for example, community contributions. So we budgeted for, for community contributions in the current fiscal year, um, but because we don't have some of those agreements in place that we need to get worked out, we rolled that over into the next year so that money could still be spent. That also includes fiscal year 23 dispatch services. Normally that's paid in January and the police department is working on an agreement for those services, something that hasn't been in place in the past. So we, we, we still acknowledge that we owe that money for those services, but we're just waiting to get that agreement in place. One that was mentioned earlier this evening were those impact fees, um, the impact fee studies. We're doing a number of those and we haven't incurred any costs on them yet. So we, we rolled that into the, into the next budget year. One of the few budget reductions came from the police department um, RMS system. And that was just simply due to timing. We budgeted for the full cost of the RMS system in the current budget year, fiscal year 23. As we created the tentative budget, what happened was we anticipated that some of those costs would roll into the next fiscal year. And what we found is that we were able to reduce that simply because we'll be able to incur those as budgeted. Um, engineering plan review. So they, they, these are pass-through costs. That's the note regarding the revenue slash expenditure, simply because as we have, um, as we send, send plans out for engineering review to a third party engineering firm, we simply charge the client, the customer, um, the, the same money that we spent on that, but we still have to account for it. Um, there was some traffic control equipment and safety equipment required. The safety budget has been kind of distributed 
from the from a safety department into various other departments. And so some of that had to be reallocated how we spent that. So that increased the in the general fund by about $7,000. Um, added back some engineering education. Um, communications advertising budget was cut as part of a essentially trying to get the budget to balance. Um, as we're able to find some more rev some more money in the budget, this was added back because it's a high priority. It's really how Lisa does her job is through advertising. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to eliminate the primary election. This is also a budget reduction um, simply due to the number of candidates declared for this election cycle. Uh, we added back the next two are finance related, some subscriptions and banking fees. Thanks uh, to Ronnie again. We, I think we mentioned that earlier for, for catching that. Additionally, what we did, and this is not a budget increase, this last item is that we broke out com community contributions by the entity um, that will be receiving those. So essentially how we uh, distribute that is, is more directly a council decision as opposed to um, making that just kind of open. I think that was the total between those was $60,000. We broke that out into the four separate line items. Um, outside of the general fund, we have uh, some minor changes. The first being in the Class C road fund. So we have two RRFB sites for $30,000. This is funded through Class C road fund balance. And RRFB stands for Rectangular Rapid Flashing, Flashing Beacons. Thank you. So these are pedestrian. Um, these are is, is for pedestrian safety. Also in the Capital Projects Fund, we adjusted the Cane Creek project based on the actual award. So we have an award. We know the amounts. And we reflected the budget to show that. It's no longer an estimate. Um, the other item that you'll see in the in as one of the attachments were capital projects. So we create enterprise fund capital projects, and there's a special attachment that's not the spreadsheet. And the reason for that is because the enterprise funds use full accrual accounting instead of modified accrual accounting, like the other governmental funds, which basically means that in a revenue revenue expense income statement these capitalized projects aren't shown. And so you have to show that in a capital projects specific budget for those enterprise funds. So in the water fund, we have the SCADA system, which is also partially shared by the sewer fund, but the majority of which is from the water fund. We have generators, which are part of the water revenue bond, 2021 water revenue bond. Also, the Spanish Trail water tank. Again, this is these are all rollover projects. Um, Spring 2 rebuild, also from the water revenue bond and the Well 12 facility. So finishing up that Well 12 project by building the facility around it. For the sewer, we have those three primary projects that were part of the sewer revenue bond issuance. The Birch, Tusher, both, um, you're, both you're, you're all familiar with those projects as well as the WRF outfall. And then we have two, pro two, not projects, one's a vehicle and one's a facility um, that are proposed to be paid for out of fund balance, cash on hand, which are the shop building construction and the sewer vacuum truck. Um, ours is an aged, that, that our current sewer vacuum truck is in need of replacement. I think it's about 10 years old and has seen better days. Uh, and then in the stormwater fund, we have a detention basin design and, oh, that was, let's see, the stormwater fund, we have, the, that's, that's a typo. So we have the Mill Creek detention basin design, which was funded via grant. And we also have the retaining wall at Woody's, which is in kind of a rollover project from prior years that we'll be moving forward with. Costs have increased on that one pretty substantially, but we have, I believe, what is now an engineering es engineering's cost estimate for that. And with that, that wraps up my presentation of the changes made in the um, proposed final budget. Questions for Ben? Um, so, 
the police provide services on the school campuses, correct? Yes. Correct. Does Grand County contribute to that expense? No. Okay. Um, maybe in the future they could since the city's servicing a portion of the county population that spends a bunch of time in the city mm -hmm. at a at Grand County schools. In my observation, um, and this is this is purely my personal observation, as I've dropped my kids off at school, I have seen Grand County Sheriff's Office at the schools. So I don't know if, and I, I would agree. Yeah. So it's yeah. cooperatively. Yeah, yeah I, okay. I would agree with that. Yeah, and I think even for a while there, a couple of years ago, Grand County had an officer who was assigned to the schools, and that's so why that I have seen them mm -hmm. quite often as well. Okay, good. Yeah, seems like it's fluctuated. Who's it? It who's, does. Who's, I don't know. I don't know if there's like a written agreement, but I think they're they're pretty equally. Okay, so, great. So, <clears throat> hey, that's what that's just outside observation as well. <clears throat> Any other questions for Ben? I'll ask for a motion. I will move to uh, adopt resolution 16-2023, a resolution adopting the fiscal year 2023-2024 budget. Second. Second. Any discussion? Tani? Nope. Uh, Luke? Anybody else? I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. All right, Ben. You're still up. If I may. You may. Thank you. No, you may not. <laughs> <laughs> you may, but you may not. No. It's a little uncomfortable for me to have this conversation in, a, in an open, open public meeting setting, but I think it's appropriate for me to express my gratitude for my time here. Um, as you all know, this will be my last city council meeting. Um, I did want to provide a little bit of context for that. Um, my time at the city has been absolutely amazing. I've really enjoyed the job. Um, I found the work challenging. I think it's important work. Um, I felt very supported by the city council, very important in a finance director position. Um, and we have a really competent team. It's great, great staff. So it's been a really good working environment and I really appreciate the environment that you all have created. Um, I want to simply just preempt maybe any my speculation about my departure by providing maybe some context uh given given that given that i i have loved my job um i it, it seems that life has a tendency to kind of slip away when we aren't deliberate in, in our decisions um as you all know i have a family two nine-year-old girls and a son who just turned two um both my wife and i are working professionals and we sometimes struggle with the life work balance challenge that we experience. Uh, for this reason, we have decided to take a bit of an extended sabbatical and spend time um, reconnecting and resetting as a family and both as a family and really professionally for me as well. Um, I considered requesting an extended leave of absence and I appreciate the support as we kind of talked through that as a possibility. Um, I was concerned about leaving the position vacant with for an extended period of time while I'm really um, unsure about what the future holds, um, both where we'll land and what my what my future career will look like. And so for that reason, I felt it best um, to simply resign and allow the city to uh, find an adequate replacement for my position. So with all of that said, it's it's difficult to say, but I wanted to just say thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to be the city's finance director. I'll always look back and really uh, look back fondly on this time working with you and uh, really trying to carve Moab into a community that, that is livable and, and enjoyable to live and work in. Um, my hope is really to depart on good terms with the city and I'm currently working through this um, with this handoff with the with the current staff and I want just want to make sure that I leave it in a good place and I want to make sure that you all feel free that if at any time you need to reach out to me that you're welcome to do that so thank you very much I appreciate it thank you Ben, Thanks, Thanks, ben. ben. we've yeah. had a great year and a half okay I can't say anything anymore this has been fun
Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. We wish you the best. Thank you. Yeah. I'm really happy for you and your family, and thank you for leaving us with that unicorn. Just a nice <laughs> cherry on top. I think that should have been our logo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. All right, Carly, you're up. Um, I have a goodbye to Ben myself. You know, I uh, think it's appropriate that he included a unicorn in his slide deck because managers call um, unicorn employees those employees that are rare and they elevate the bar for the rest of the team. And that's certainly been true for Ben. Um, we're going to miss you. And I just hope it's not the last we see of him. So thanks so much, Ben. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, other updates, hard to keep that. I, I can't look at you, Joe. It's going to make you cry too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> some fun things to look forward to. Uh, June 16th, as a reminder, is our ne next arts and ag market at Swanee Park uh, from five to dusk. Uh, this market will feature free dark skies themed activities. So come out if you're curious about some dark, dark skies programming. Um, June 23rd is our next free movie in the park. It'll be at the ball field starting at 8.30. They are playing Mean Girls, which is a very excellent movie. Important to me as sort of formative for it to be mean. Um, <laughs> you failed. <laughs> uh, the police department will be conducting an active shooter training Wednesday through Friday of this week. I believe it's at the elementary school. No, high school. So don't be alarmed if you kind of see that training happening. Um, and finally, it's weird we're announcing a departure and, and really sad to see you then. Um, I want to announce an addition to the city. We have hired a new community development director. His name is Michael Black. He's a Utah native, started his career in community development um, in Potter Heights and was their community development director for a number of years. But he's been working in Oregon for more than a decade. Um, and he'll be starting mid-July. So it's from Ashland, Oregon. Excited to come back to uh, to Utah. He's a river runner, so he's kind of thrilled to be in Moab. And um, we're really excited to be meet him. I think he's going to be a great addition to the team. And he's going to be reaching out to each of you, of course, and getting to know the community. So great to have Michael on board. We're excited to see him. That's all I've got. Great. Thanks, Carly. Um, moving on to council reports, we'll start with you, Ronnie. Oh. Okay. Let's see. Uh, been a while since the last meeting. Uh, as many of you probably did, I attended the May 24th uh, open house uh, for the water utility resource management plan. Um, had an interesting conversation with Ben Miner, as was discussed in many of our meetings. Um, he discussed some of the things um, Summit County did with their ordinance and the role of concurrency. And so I would just uh, ask that we as a council and the public get a little more schooled on that and how that can inform our steps. Um, I'm clearly obvious that you don't um, copy and paste these things. I, I get that. Uh, let's see, May 25th, uh, I had an online um, webinar with the Western Leaders Network on climate-friendly land use. Uh, May 25th, Fifth, um, Grand County um, held a workshop uh, from one to four, and I had to pull up the name of this so I don't get it wrong, um, on the Grand County Hazard Mitigation Plan workshop. Um, this is pretty fascinating, um, together with FEMA, um, basically a whole discussion with uh, members from the community about uh, different um, hazards identified by uh, law enforcement and other people in the community as areas of concern. So um, just everything you can think of from um, fire and flooding to um, some you wouldn't have thought of. So it was actually quite fascinating. And uh, I know Cora Phillips will be working um, uh, with them and, um, and I'm sure Carly as our um, uh, as our rep in this regard, because some of the stuff they were doing was drilling down and getting pretty detailed on some of the projects that we have um, uh, in the works I might be thinking about that might address um, some of the concerns we have, like, okay, stormwater projects or other things, and they actually have full-on worksheets um, to list all of these projects, and so I did ask um, that they either do um, a separate meeting because um, uh, there weren't, I think, many people there from the city, either with the council and the staff, or at least meet with um, staff department heads. Um, and I'm sure they'll be doing that with Carly because clearly um, somebody like um, Chuck or Levi is going to be able to fill out these sheets and make these lists a lot faster um, than I am. But I thought um, it was a great um, 
eye opener to um, both the obvious hazards you think of and uh, other ones that people listed. Um, I had an impromptu uh, a walk with Barbara Michelle from Department of Energy in Grand Junction. I happened to be there and she kept offering um, to those of us who work on the Site Futures Committee um, from Las Colonias um, that we should come out and see the park again um, at a time when it was um, in greater use um, in hotter weather. Um, so we walked around for a few hours. Um, and again, just a reminder, people, if you haven't been there, um, especially as um, uh, maybe inspiration for what some of the things that might be done um, with uh, the UMTRA um, site that we have here, um, water and sewer allowing, um, you know, these are just some of the things we walk past. Um, there are several uh, play areas for kids. They have a whole enclosed pond, um, largely that people paddleboard on. They have things like paddleboard yoga that the city is actually running a rental. So they derive some revenue from that, um, a rental for paddleboard, then they do um, some classes. Um, they have a lot of picnic menu, uh, venues, multiple large dog park areas, of course, separated like ours for size of dog. Um, got a better look at the amphitheater than we did when we went in November, um, where they have concerts. I know I've met several people in the last few weeks who went to concerts there, so it's always interesting to hear about people's, people seem to really like that venue and have a good experience there. Um, uh, those of you who may have been around uh, on the trails along the Colorado River, um, just stretching from Loma to Palisade, know, um, especially around Grand Junction, they have a few places with life, ja life jacket stations. Um, uh, so that's a cool thing, too, for people who might just be coming to use it and want to be safe, but maybe not be fully outfitted. Um, they have, of course, this, I guess they call it the River Park uh, channel of water that basically um, diverts off the main stem of the Colorado um, in along the walking path. Um, and so they have um, great signage telling people if you're a raft, you have to stay in the main channel. If you're a smaller craft, you have the option to come through this river park. Um, and so obviously the river was high, so nobody was really out there, but a lot of people walking and biking on paths, um, just, you know, dipping their toes in the water along with um, dogs. They also have um, a disc golf course, Arboretum and Pollinator Garden, um, bike repair stations, um, lots of interp signs on the human history in the areas where some the natural history, uh, a large bike skills park. Um, and we did get a better look, um, at least from the outside, at the outside offices of Rocky Mounds. And um, I'm gonna forget the other name, but there was a sign saying Riverfront and Zip Adventures that I actually think the company name might be different. But anyway, the two um, companies that are um, do have le leases on site um, uh, that are outdoor uh, industry related. Um, and so that was really interesting. Um, and let's see. Um, the only other thing I was going to add is I had written a few emails just about um, uh, just to make sure the council and community is up to date on mosquitoes and um, just fire warnings. So I know um, Lisa has done um, great outreach in the past um, to remind us all both about firework season and, and mitigation. So I know I've been getting some emails from residents just asking that we continue to do that sort of thing. And um, uh, I know Chase Goulson, who's the city rep, uh, with Moab uh, Mosquito Abasement District um, had said, and this is always a great reminder for people, is go to the Mosquito Abatement District um, website. There's an info um, email there. Um, and also um, you can also email the manager just with any questions, but um, so much good information there and so many good articles recently um, in the Sun and the and the TI. So just to remind us all how to uh, reduce we, we habitats. I know for me, I took my rain chain down. Um, that was it. Thanks, Ronnie. Tawny. Um, let's see. I spoke on the mayor's behalf at the um, Memorial Day celebration that um, was held at the courthouse and was very auspiciously addressed or introduced as not the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny. Um, we had a Canyonland Health, Canyonlands Health Care Special Service District last week. Um, it was record time. It began at 5.35 and ended at 6.08. It was just basically just finances and business and um, the um, National Park Service asked if they could dig some holes in our property and do a some kind of a drill. So we thought that was okay because they were going to put them back up. And I was going to mention the active shooter drill too, because at the Memorial Day event, when they did the however many gun salutes they did, the people at 
outside of the restaurant over there just about hit the deck. <laughs> wow. It scared them. Yeah. yeah. We should maybe have them notified so they're not shocked when it happens <laughs> at Veterans Day. Thanks, Tawny. Jason. Um, I don't have anything to report last I haven't had any board meetings. I missed an airport board meeting last night um, due to some family things going on. Um, but I don't have anything. I'd just like to tell Ben thank you for everything. Um been awesome working with you and wish you the best. Taylor. Um, the solid waste district is in the process of doing a more in depth rate study, um, which also include elements of a capital improvement plan. And as part of uh, choosing that firm, I had six meetings, mm -hmm. including one with Chuck and Ben, who were very helpful in providing perspective and experience on in these matters. I attended the WERMP open house and which was great to have some one-on-one -on -one time with the various team members and I hope that the interested public takes advantage of these opportunities for I think making an effort to include them and so um, um, that'd be great. Um, I attended a Moab area housing task force meeting our monthly meeting and the uh, main work was on goals for the um, housing plan, and that will be ongoing. And um, those are important because it sort of sets the high level. What, what are we hoping to achieve and how does our more specific uh, policy decisions uh, reflect that? So those will be coming to you. The intention is soon, but we'll see since it's um, being done in-house. Um, I attended a community renewable energy agency board meeting and the big news there was that we have hired a PR firm to help us with our public outreach, which I think will be a significant improvement. Um, they did a, an audit of our current materials and um, identified areas for improvement that they're going to help us. So, and I attended a sustainability plan kickoff meeting, which is primarily staff. It was inwardly focused, but that is underway. Um, and so that was looking at um, sort of high level at what are the opportunities and challenges and how to engage with the technical advisory committee. So that's what I've got. Thanks, Kaylin. Luke. So I also attended the Worm Open House and um, yeah, thought it was a great event. I had some really great discussions with the team members, the community members, and was really excited to see a lot of our local residents being able to engage with uh, the engineers and consultants that we've hired um, and kind of get some of their more uh, personalized questions answered um, and kind of continue to urge uh, our residents to continue engaging in that process um, as it's ongoing. I attended a planning commission meeting last week where uh, the planning commission moved forward with a positive recommendation about a new site plan that is going to include uh, 156 unit development, um, 75 one bedroom units, 72 bedroom units, and 11 three bedroom units. A um, lot of parking and are going to have a clubhouse on site as well. Um, we had an interesting presentation about a shared parking agreement for the Radcliffe Hotel. Um, it's just kind of like really tight back there, and there's some issues with uh, emergency services like um, accessibility. And so the property owner actually owns the former dealership right next there. And so they're going to be sharing parking spaces in the interim with the option to uh, make use of that property for different uses in the future. Um, and then um, Planning Commission finished off with what I found to be a really enlightening conversation kind of regarding um, what uh, Corey had kind of termed as the residential commercial inversion. Um, and so kind of what some of the trends that Planning Department have been noticing with such a high focus on housing across our community. A lot of our commercial spaces are going towards the development of high density housing, uh, which with Moab being so built out, the amount of commercial space within our boundaries is pretty limited. And so what's kind of happening is the planning department and 
uh, the city is seeing a lot more applications for um, home occupation. So for residents applying for licenses to operate their businesses out of their residence. So we're kind of moving commercial into residential a little bit. Um, and so just kind of coming up with ideas as to how we can potentially prioritize and incentivize keeping those two types of zonings a little bit more separate just so we minimize the impact or the potential impact on existing neighborhoods and kind of residences. Um, and then, yeah, it's also kind of having an impact on a lot of our community services and everything. I think some of them are in a bit of the like a legal non-conforming status. And so kind of making sure that in our desire to address the very, very impactful uh, uh, housing crisis that our community is facing is that we're kind of thinking through the butterfly effect that some of our actions might kind of have on, on yeah, it's the whole good intentions, unintended consequences principle. Um, I attended a trail mix meeting earlier today where we had a representative from Utah Raptor State Park come and kind of give us a little bit of an update on that. They were a little bit delayed, uh, partially because it took them a while to locate suitable water um, in terms of quantity and quality, but they've been able to dig a second well where they've been able to find that. Um, and hopefully we should be seeing trailers moving dirt in the next two to three weeks on that. Um, we kind of got updates about the access that, um, access changes that are gonna be kind of associated with that. So if I remember correctly, um, like Dalton Wealth and Willow Spring Roads will be um, kind of closed off and there will be a new entrance kind of in the middle of there. Um, It'll still be accessible to uh, people wanting to access like uh, Clonzo and everything. Um, they're looking at potentially allowing up to class two e-bikes in the area. And I think the main Willow Springs campground will have electricity and water. And they're thinking about having about 70 campsites in that area. Uh, but kind of with the supply chain issues, it's, uh, I think their transformer orders are 14 months out. so. Um, it's going to be a little bit to get that. Um, they still want to continue to allow primitive camping in the area. Um, and I forget who it was that potentially received the funding for this, but um, I think there's potentially grant funding or some sort of funding that was obtained or is on the precipice of it being obtained that will extend the bike path from Moab Giants up to Utah Raptor State Park. Um, and then I guess Mitt Romney's office is really wanting to build e-bike access into Arches to just kind of um, ideally help curtail some of the uh, wait times in line and kind of give accessibility to a different user group into the park. Um, Trailmix is also looking to partner with local bike shops to take donations on behalf of pretty eager tourists, um, but they're kind of working on some of the kinks with that uh, to better support uh, the trail mix group to uh, kind of maintain a lot of the trails um, available. And then there's some initial discussions about honoring like longstanding members of the community that have contributed significantly to promoting and developing recreational opportunities in our area. And yeah, I, I think that's everything that I attended on that. I don't want to necessarily pile on more on Ben, but yeah, I'm just a quick thank you and maybe a quick motion to like amend the fiscal year 2023 year budget to maybe purchase the like a unicorn mascot to the office named Ben. <laughs> Fill the void. Yeah. yeah. There is a unicorn down at the Canyonlands Care Center in their lobby. You can ask it's for that. Silly. Yeah, we can ask for that to be <laughs> replaced up here, you know. I think we should give his daughter a, a small budget to go select one. That, yeah. uh, yes. Like that. As most dad like. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Um, busy a couple of weeks for me, as you know, um, I was on the boundary commission. Uh, I attended a couple of meetings of, regarding this annexation that we had tonight. Um, we went to CIB on June 1st and got the confirmation that we did receive the funding request for Cane Creek Boulevard. So that's all set and we'll be moving forward with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I met with Jay, Jen Sadoff to just talk about things that are happening at the hospital and with healthcare in general. They have a new electronic medical record, and there's been some challenges, as always, when you implement that kind of a program. The <clears throat> excuse me, uh, expansion of the hospital is moving along. I think they're going to plan. They're hoping to open in the spring, so it should be done here um, by next year. 
And she and I are working together to develop uh, a process and a planning for the continuation of the MAPS project down by the hospital. See if we can get that going. We did um, put in a grant request for CIB for planning for that. And we did identify potential uh, committee members and um, you will be hearing more about that in the future. Let's see, uh, tomorrow we, uh, Jason and Carly and I will be going down to Monticello to attend the Outdoor Adventure Commission. Uh, they are meeting to do a strategic plan workshop for program policy and project needs in Southeastern Utah. I think it's really important for us to be there. Um, so, and I think Trish Hedden is also going to be there. We, um, there'll be a, a AOG transit meeting to talk about transit and um, uh, transportation in Southeast Utah. Uh, AOG is looking at doing that. And since Moab's kind of ahead of the game, they wanna hear from us. Uh, Richard will be going to that. Uh, I'll probably be attending online just to observe. Uh, I watched the, the film commission roundtable discussion about whether to move it out to the Red Cliffs Foundation or to keep it in the county. That was very uh, interesting. I think there's moving forward. I'm not sure where that's going to go, but I also was able to do a site visit to the Horizon set, which was very interesting. Um, I was, it was like one of the coolest things I've ever done actually. So um, I was able to sit behind Costner as he was directing the scene. That was pretty cool. Um, I also got to speak with him and some of his producers about continued funding for tax incentives for filming in rural Utah. So I'll be having more conversations with them about that. And, and uh, we'll be working with the legislature to make sure they extend that tax incentive, which is due to sunset uh, at the end of this year, I believe. And um, I noticed that three of you do not have new laptops. So make sure you get your new laptops from Denny when you have a chance. You have it? No? Okay. Um, anyway, so that would be good. Um, he's waiting to hear from you. If you need any information, I'll be happy to send that to you. I also um, have been working on our rules and procedures for um, city council meetings. It's right here. It also got, includes a new code of conduct, which will apply to us and all of our boards and commissions in the city. So I will be forwarding that to you tomorrow. Carly and I are going to give it one more review, and then I really would like all your input. If you can get that back to me by Monday, that would be great. And then we can forward it off to Lisa for her legal review and hopefully have it on the agenda um, for June 27th for discussion and consideration. Um, I know that that's kind of a tight window. The latest I'd like for you guys to consider it would be the first meeting in July because we want to kind of have it um, align with the new fiscal year. So um, you'd be looking for that. I also, we also will be doing Carly's evaluation. So I'll be sending you some information about that. And then we're all going to be meeting in the next week in between and we can talk about her evaluation at that time. Um, and that's all I have. And so with that, we do not have an executive session. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Kaylin, second by Lucan. All in favor? Aye.